Hello, Barry. It's so Hello. nice. To... Hello. Yeah. It's so nice to get to have this discussion about your exhibition, The Happiest Place on Earth. Uh, could you please briefly tell us about yourself as a photographer, if we if we start there? Yes. Okay. Well, I've been taking photos for the past decade, really, and I suppose I only began to call myself, describe myself as a photographer, as opposed to um, a painter or, or an artist or as a photographer um, the last 10 years. So I'm a photographer artist, but before mm -hmm. that I was doing uh, a, lo a lot of large canvases and smaller silk screens. Um, and I guess the interest in photography kind of came through the art practice and the, uh, specifically through the silk screening. So I was doing a lot of images about, about the figure, about the figure in various forms of dissolution or you know, but, and then I called them things like entropic figure or tumescent figure. And I started to place these strange amorphous figures into landscapes that were quite dystopian, really. And I was looking for certain landscapes that kind of captured or resonated with the figures that I was doing, which was quite eerie in a way and quite kind of um, suggesting different psychological states or quite, quite primitive states of mind. And, and kind of so I was using quite a lot of. Um, images, photographic images that I was then using in the silk screen. I was doing photo silk screening. So I was kind of like led to using images that I took around while I was living in Brighton of kind of derelict empty places. And then I got a few interesting comments saying I really like the photos by people, suggesting that they like the photos more than they liked the silk screens and, and more well, than how they... did that feel? <laughs> yeah. Well in a way at the time it felt quite hurtful. And then afterwards, because I had all the photos arranged on the walls, and then afterwards, actually, because actually I, it was problematic keeping the studio practice going. We had children. It was just it was difficult keeping up a studio practice and going in. And it was very difficult to, to keep up the silk screen because it was it's a technical art and it, it easily goes wrong. So you need consistent time. So because I became, um, in a way, disillusioned with the art that I was doing, I became more and more interested in the photographs. And in a way, the photographs allowed me to get back into the art. And also I became more intrigued in the photographic image within my practice than, than in a way than my paintings. I kind of like, I did a complete bolt face. I like, suddenly I was enamored by photography. And, and it, was, it was a new thing to me quite late on in my artistic career, because up to then I'd been very fascinated by artists like Francis Bacon and, and, and Basilitz and sort of certain very figurative, expressive, um, artists and suddenly there was a whole world of photography which was like you know it was almost like I was a kid in a, in a toy shop thinking wow mm -hmm. so I had a lot of learning to do and I, I became quite obsessed by these landscapes and these derelict places and then realizing actually it was quite a lot of fun to go around photographing derelict places and yeah and then uh, realizing that those photos were very generic because there's a lot of people that do photograph ruins and, and then in a way tightening up the themes and the ideas behind the photograph and, and the projects. So, so then thinking how you could you find similar types of images really in your backyard, literally in your backyard. So walking around my local neighborhood, looking at the backs of shops, loading bays, concrete, you know, car park. I did a whole series on car parks that was completely obsessed by car parks for a while because they weren't <laughs> derelict and they weren't, mm. obvious. they were just a space that, that people didn't see or, or people, neglected to see. So I was fascinated by the urban environment, but not like an architect, more like someone who wants to go somewhere where, you know, people would, um, you know, you'd find a dead pigeon or you'd, you'd go and have a piss in the corner or, you know, they weren't nice places. But I think because of that, I was intrigued by them because I get it was continue the idea of the sense of the self in a sort of uncomfortable position or kind of eerie, you know, that that's the mm -hmm term called the un unheimlich I think which is the unhomely or eerie so I was fascinated yeah. with that so I was really yeah so that's how I got into oh, and made that leap I suppose yeah, it's it's always interesting to to learn that not many many journeys are like straight from one point to the other and everything is planned but that's a lot of things tend to happen happen along the way and and that's how you're pushed in the in the right direction and I think also I really, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed going out. And it was more sociable in a way than being in a studio. Mm. I think I was very lonesome in a way, but going out now with the camera and finding other people to link it, it became almost like a social thing as well as a solitary thing. You know, you could yeah. go, you could be very solitary as a photographer, but you could also then go out on a jaunt with a friend. 
to a place and the whole day was like an escapade and you're also taking photos and, and that I think that aspect was really healthy actually for me. Yeah interesting. Um, I've, I've uh, studied your homepage a little and on it I, I read that uh, you have documented places that have undergone collective trauma and loss uh, with a focus on on Eastern Europe and uh, that you have a uh, explored how certain locations hold a sense of collective loss related to trauma and, and, and atrocity and the project we're talking now is is about is about happiness how mm. how long is the jump from trauma to to happy happiness uh, mm. for you it seems like a long one <laughs> yeah. when i think about it well uh, it's an interesting question because for, for me in a way there's a continuum between the two projects, it's almost like they're two sides of the same coin because the project in Eastern Europe, particularly looking at the Jewish narrative, is about the loss, it's a collective loss and it's about looking for um, a rich culture that, that was doc well documented and existed and, and was decimated, completely annihilated. And it's about that idea that that community, which was rich and full and had a lot to give and was functioning well, is not there. And in a way, coming to County Island and looking at um, a very, what, what appears to be a very healthy society that has a lot, in a way, to teach the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's almost like the two sides, and it's like a continuum. And I think really, in many ways, a lot of my projects are like little stepping stones in between the two things. So in a way, if we're looking at society and community and history, and if I think about the history of Finland, um, which I don't know a great deal about. I mean, I'm not a historian, but I, I know a great deal of more about the history of Eastern Europe in a way. But in a way, there's, there is a kind of an overlap between what unified Finland in terms of the, the Winter War and how you repelled the Russians, but were still occupied, but you kept your unity. And it seemed in way, what happened in Eastern Europe is the opposite of that. Again, it's the other side. It, of the yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. It was occupied and carved up, and their national identity was was really, really hammered. And again, you know, the Jewish narrative is part of a, a national narrative and, you know, there's so much blame and so much complicated stuff that's, that's there in that narrative that, in a way, it's not a big leap for me. In a way, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an interesting perspective to come from a different perspective and not, and, you know, because in a way, this project wasn't determined just by me, it came out of a bigger group. Yeah. Yeah, tell us, tell us how did the, the project come well, the, the actual, the County Island project, the, the Happiest Place on Earth, is, is part of a, a wider project, which is actually nine projects that come together. Um, and that's part of the MAP6 project, which is called the Finland The Happiness Project. And that was based on the World um, Happiness Report. So it was because Finland actually was rank, had ranked so high, I mean, third year in a row. We'll see how you go this year, but third year in a row. And I think, you know, we, we posed it to ourselves as a group as a really interesting topic and subject because the group is um, a group of nine, well now it's 10 photographers, but every, every year we go to a different place. But with the Finland project, we wanted to do a, a longer project, like a two year project. And I think, you know, there was a lot of ideas on the table, you know, uh, about where we would go. Cause you know, we have a, the luxury and a way of choosing a place to go to, whether it's close to home or further away, mostly within Europe. We haven't gone mm -hmm. to Lithuania or Finland. But um, the ideas on the table were, were mostly around Brexit and the, the sort of the, the state of the world. And I think this idea of the happiness report seemed like something so different. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and in a way kind of ironic as well. It's like, this would be a really interesting. And I think it was just such a novel, interesting idea. And, and it was a very rich idea. So. My project is just one of nine. One of nine, okay. Yeah, so, mm. yeah. Interesting. And, and often we, we go to a country in a way just to explore that country and, and, and give us, but I think with, with this, with Finland in particular, we had more of a focus because it was based on the happiness report, which is set out with six different key markers about what they, they constitute as happiness. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, we've, we've said happiness many times here already. Uh, mm. If you look at the, at the concept, how it's used in your work, what does it, what does it include? And is, is it something mm. that it excludes also? What does the concept mm. mean here? 
I mean, you know, you have to bear in mind that I come from the UK and, you know, the word happy. I mean, there's a lot of irony in the whole term. There's a lot, of, a lot of things to question. I think the word happiness is a red herring. I don't think it is about happiness at all. It's certainly not about personal happiness. It's about societal well-being. I think that's what it, the key thing is. That's what I was most interested in. You know, when we had um, the idea of the happiness report, my, my project came out of, in a way, taking the whole term literally, saying, well, you know, what's happy? How do you document happiness? Do you mm-hmm. do happy people? Do you, do, so my Google search was, you know, happiest place within Finland. If Finland's the happiest country in the world, the happiest place within Finland would be the happiest place on earth. So I just thought that was quite ironic and quite playful. So I was playing around with it really, which of course led me to County Island. Mm-hmm. But um, the idea of happiness, I think is, it's interesting because when I've spoken to many people in Finland, most people are very reserved and wouldn't use that term. In fact, you know, it's been um, said to me that really the term, the better term to use is life satisfaction or meaningfulness within life. And certainly that's something that um, has more in a way um, depth to it than, than happiness, because it's not, like I say, it's not personal. It's more about the social well-being and what the infrastructure is and what makes society work well on a national level. And, you know, I mean, obviously within Finland, there's many things that are difficult. You know, there's many issues within Finland. And mm. I'm not an academic or historian, so I, I don't know all of those things, but I know it's not as easy as that. And I think um, the claim to happiness is something that people don't don't make normally. They say, well, you know, they, this is going well, this is going well, this isn't going well, but on the whole, this if you compare it to other places, this is going well, I suppose. And I suppose the other thing to say, which isn't in the project, but was the intention, because we were going to do a, a two-year project, was that it was going to be a comparative study with another location. So this was, in a way, taking a, a place in, in the south of Finland, which is more populated, uh, more affluent, I suppose, and comparing it with somewhere much further north, like um, in Lapland, which would have been um, a place which would have a, a recent history of depopulation, for instance, and then comparing the two to sort of say, you know, what, what, what how does this compare? Uh, what does the community think about being mm. happy? You know, getting it was really about getting people's responses to this. Yeah, to that really sounds very like a really large project. So perhaps mm. <laughs> it was easier when it was boiled down to only one, only one city. It was in a way, but I'd still like to, in a way, pick that up again. I think it'd be- Yeah, really... you, do, you do it. No, <laughs> I've seen this. Well, it'd be interesting to compare because obviously there's many factors to Kani Island which could um, make it a more cohesive functioning society, which, which could be about affluence as much as anything else. So it'd be interesting mm-hmm. to compare in a way. You know. could, could you tell us a little, little about the, the exhibition as a whole? What is it that you are showing in, in our gallery? Well, I'm showing near enough all portraits. So the, the, the project that I decided to do was going to be a portrait of the city. And I thought, again, I took, I, I played around and I took that in a way, in a playful way, I took it literally, like it's going to be portraits. So it would just be portraits. So the, the portraits form the portrait of the city. So there's very few landscapes. I haven't photographed a beautiful lake. I haven't photographed the shopping centre, I haven't both, you know, I, I've left them out kind of on purpose. So in a way there's, there's not, um, as I think I would have done in lots of other projects, I would have put context in, I would have shown the environment, but, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do this about the people and also the conversations that I had with the people. And, you know, it, it was an amazing project in many ways because doors just opened. Mm-hmm. I was allowed to photograph um, two young people doing their music exam. So I'm taking photos whilst they're playing with the viola or violin and I'm taking and the camera's going snap. I'm thinking, you know, I've interrupted them, but they were absolutely fine about it. So mm. very, very, very accommodating. So, <clears throat> yes. So, mm. so it is the exhibition is a series of different portraits of different sizes. So I've kind of chosen a few that are larger than others. And the idea is to have each board within the exhibition space is five large boards. And on each board is, I believe, five images, give or take. Yeah, so five images per board in different, they're all roughly the same arrangement, but but within each board is kind of a dialogue between different. So one is 
seems to be more about family. One is about, um, yeah, it's, it's a range of different things, but it's showing the community, the range, mm -hmm. as much of the range of the community that I met. Yeah. Further on in the library, we have a long wall above the reference section, which has more in-depth interviews, uh, which I was lucky to get for my second visit just before lockdown. Um, and again, more, more portraits, more close-up portraits. Would you was was there other themes that that sort of crystallized? You mentioned family, and uh... there's, there's family, but I mean I've. I've tried to get in as, as much a, as broad a cross section. So I've got people, I've got the art school in there. So there's a bit where there's people, it looks like younger people doing things. There's a digi lab, there's the art school, there's a music academy. Yes. So there's kind of like, there's, there's in a way the themes aren't too particular. They're kind of vague, but I wanted images that showed a range of different types of activities and people and different age ranges, because that is the society I think that works. You know, the functioning of Kalen seems to be based on the fact that lots of people have lots of things to do. That are very close by, you know, from the adult education centre to the indoor gym, you know, to the lake, to the you know the music academy and the arts. It's very localised, very small. You've got the football mm -hmm. team that I was photographed, the volunteer fire brigade. So they're all in there, and it, it just shows, in a way, the cross section of society. Whether or not it shows people necessarily being happy or not, I don't know. It'd be interesting to know what people think really when they see the exhibition, what, what the, the feeling they get from seeing just a, whole, a lot of portraits of people. Mm -hmm. uh, Meaningful uh, things. Mm, yeah. Did, would you say that this project went as planned or, or were there surprises along? Uh, it, it was, it, it was and it has been a, a dream project in many ways. It came together surprisingly well, you know, because the um, the way that we operate as a collective, the Map Six Collective, is it's it's a tricky way of doing it because it's a bit like Zen photography. You go somewhere, you spend a few days, you put together a project, you come home, you edit it, you you put together an exhibition, and it's it's not a long form type of photography. So, for instance, my other project, especially in Eastern Europe, is a long form documentary project. So I go back and I go back and I go back. You know, I amass a whole dossier of images. This is very quick. You've got to be very organized. So once I had the idea, once I'd located uh, Kanyana, then I sent out a message. And, and obviously um, I had a few um, identified figures because there'd, there'd been, the newspapers have come and done an article on the city. So, you know, um, that, and that, that's why it came up on the Google search as the happiest place on earth. Because I think Christopher, uh, the mayor, had described it like that. So, you know, I kind of owe it to him, really. And then the doors opened. And well, it was Christopher, really. Once I had um, contacted the mayor, he was very enthusiastic. I mean, you know, unusually enthusiastic. And then I went back to him and said, What do you want? You know, who do you want to meet? So I just I had a, a search about the different types, you know, from the yoga studio. I just sort of did a whole cross section. These are the sorts of people I would like to meet. And he sent me back a whole list. And then people were very open, you know, and I think, I think the common thought was, well, if you're meeting the mayor, then of course we'll meet you. So mm -hmm. it seemed to open up a lot of doors, but, you know, in terms of kind of is, is my perceptions of Kainan is very much based on the reception I received and how open people were. Yes. And it's, it's, it's certainly different than other projects and other places that I've tried to reach out to. It's much, it's been, you know, the reception has been very open, which is, Again, is an interesting insight into the city, or or maybe into Finland generally. We do not really have a reputation for being very open, so this this does sound like 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 luck in in some way that it went like this. So, do you do you then think that that Kauniainen is the, the happiest place on earth? 
Well, it's, it's interesting because I think someone said this to me recently, if you go to County Anne and get off the train station, well, it's difficult to say this is, you know, it's not like you're going to say Shells or, you know, um, Singapore, or yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to see how you would describe this place as the happiest place on earth. But I guess that's not what the project's about, which is why I didn't do landscapes. The project is about the, the sense of societal well-being. And I think, you know, if you look at the World Happiness Report, it's not about are you, it, it doesn't ask the question, are you happy? It says, you know, they're measuring things like generosity and safety. And, you know, it's not just about the GDP or you know, uh, it's not like Bhutan, like we, when they've got, you know, a sense of Buddhist happiness or well-being, it's something different. So I suppose in terms of kind of the way this is, you know, the city functions and the con connectivity, it seemed unusually cohesive and people, everybody, and, and of course, you know, it's, it's difficult because my cross-section is only, is limited to the amount of people I could see in the time that I saw the people. So I tried to get as wide a range as possible, but everyone said they felt safe in the city. Everyone said that they had a range of activities that were accessible within the city. And people that I met who nipped across from Espoo said they'd love to live there. You know, and they access the services there. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't describe it as the happiest place on earth, but I, certainly I'd describe it as a, as a healthy society. Yeah, healthy comes up several mm. times in, in your texts too, like happiness and, happiness and health that they mm. correlate. And well, thank you so much for this, Barry. That's all right. It's welcome. It's nice to talk about the project, really. Yeah. And, it, you know, I'm very appreciative that you put on the exhibition. In fact, the exhibition is up as we talk, isn't it? We just haven't had... It is, yeah. Uh, ...been opened to visitors, but <laughs> it's, it's there. So it's our fingers crossed for that, too. Yes. Yes.